Paul. Kathy! Since he hit the road with Duel 25 years ago, Steven Spielberg has made movies non-stop. But after Schindler's List, he took a three-year break to form a new company and bring up a family. Now he's returned with a vengeance with a lost world. Just when you thought it was safe to go back into the park, there's another one. Thank God for sight B. Sight B. We bred the animals there and nurtured them for a few months and then moved them into the park. Life will find a way, as you once so eloquently put it. And by now, we have a complete ecological system on the island without fences, without boundaries. And for four years, I've tried to keep it safe from human interference. Well, uh, that's right, that's right. I mean, hopefully you've kept this island quarantined uh, and contained, but I'm in shock about all this. I've organized an expedition. What do you mean, like with people? Strictly observation and documentation. Four members only. Four? Uh, people? John, you'd need, like, uh, the National Guard. No, 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 no. The carnivores are isolated in the interior of the island so the team can stay on the outer rim. Don't worry, Ian. I'm not making the same mistakes again. No, you're making, you're making all new ones. Because it's a sequel, you have to be patient and learn what the story reasons are to justify the existence of the sequel. And I think that's just one of the, you know, it's one of the bitter pills that any sequel maker has to swallow. Uh, there's so much more setup time than there is in a normal original story. Uh, um, I think we certainly cut to the chase quicker in The Lost World because we have dinosaurs very nearly uh, on the opening of the curtain. But uh, then we still have that sort of fairly long stretch where you have to get to know new characters and understand what the new story is about and, and, and figure out what the new rules of the game are and then we embark on the journey. And then at, from that point on to the end, it's just a, it's a flat out, you know, full speed adventure. When you started making this film, you hadn't called action for three years. Were you a bit rusty? I was the first couple of days. I think I was awfully rusty. But um, it is a bit like getting back on a bicycle. You know, you, you pick it up pretty quickly. And, uh, and then the, the, the ambrosia takes over, and, and, and you kick yourself for not having worked for three years. Well, you've reached a position of eminence in your profession, and people would defer to you by and large. But whom do you still look to for advice to say, Stephen, you're wrong on this? Who can tell you what to do? I, I have always, all through my career, had people in my life. As a matter of fact, the people who work with me, the closest are the people who aren't afraid of me, who aren't intimidated by me, or whatever you know, my name stands for. You know, they, they, they know that I'm, the name is one thing and who I am is something totally different. And so I, I've always found myself with people who are honest and direct with me and not afraid to say this stinks or this isn't any good or I sure wouldn't want, wouldn't want my kids to see that. And, and I've always I've chosen people to work in my life, on my films, who aren't afraid to be honest with me. Well, who are these people? Can you name a well, for my Well, from my cameraman to my film editor, to the head of my company, Walter Parks, to my partners, David Geffen and Jeffrey Katzenberg, to my wife, first and foremost, Kate. I mean, I mean I'm mean, i surrounded by, you know, m my best critics. And if she wanders this way. Now I just want to stay on E and doing his whole thing, calling, you know, on the frequencies. And then you get really scared. Yeah, Janusz Kaminski, okay, right director of I photography. Come, keep on coming he like won this an Oscar one. for you Schindler's List. Towards the window. Now come towards me, now. Look at that. That's nice. That's gorgeous. Okay. Why don't we just do it without the creature? Just untie the, the creature. And, and the, the creature will be right here. Then yeah, tie the creature. Not tie exactly. the creature in. So, so let's. What, how do we do that? Do we want to oh, move the line on? Stan we Winston, right here, in charge of visual right effects. How bad is it? Well, if we don't set it, this baby's going to die. The baby's gonna Julianne Moore we'll plays a paleontologist. He'll we'll be able to run or even walk. A predator will pick him up before he's a couple weeks old. Okay. Turn. Roar! Roar again! 
I, I pretty much went into this like, like a big boy with both of my eyes open. It's very hard to top yourself um, uh, with any sequel. And I pretty much knew that going in. Um, what you will never have when you make a, a second Indiana Jones or even a second and third Star Wars is the debut of something no one has ever seen the likes of before. So you have to immediately, when you make a sequel, take out one of the greatest reasons that people came to see the movie initially was that it was about something and they heard it contained effects and ideas that they had never seen in any other film previous to that moment. And because of that, when you make a sequel, already the audience knows about the magic. And now they're pretty much saying, okay, now what do you have, you ha what do you have to show off? And you need a story to draw them for the second time around. <laughs> Not an ancient religious ceremony, but a modern movie technique. In order to see how the Tyrannosaurus Rex will look when it's later generated by computer, the dinosaur has a cardboard stand-in. Start down there as you change the guy out. Now he's going to have to grab him in mid-stride and he'll throw him past the camera. So by the time he grabs him, the T-Rex is still moving. Will the head be whipping close to us? Well, you know, and then... Dennis Murren of Industrial Light and Magic checks the choreography to make sure he and his team can match the human images. Kevin. Do you think George Lucas was slightly inspired by you to um, put some more animals into uh, Star Wars for his re-release? Did he, did he talk to you? He told, he told me that, that, uh, that Jurassic Park gave him the idea of re-releasing Star Wars Empire Strikes Back and Jedi uh, by using computer you know, you know, animation and computer graphic imaging to enhance and get rid of some of the matte lines and create new creatures and new characters that he couldn't do before to bring back Jabba the Hutt for instance, fully CGI'd. So he, he told me uh, that that's the reason he reissued the three films. There were some spin-offs from Jurassic Park. Um, video games, for instance, those good fun to create? Uh, the great thing about doing video games is the audience is more in control of the experience. Mm -hmm. uh, when you come to see Lost World, you know, I'm controlling the experience because I made the movie. But when you're sitting at your PC or when you're sitting at your little game station, uh, and you're playing on your PlayStation or your Sega, uh, you know, or your Nintendo. What you're really doing is you are controlling uh, the, the fate of your characters. And you turn left, you get eaten. You turn right, you live. It depends. So uh, that, that's fun in a different kind of way. We have a game out right now called The Director's Chair, which it's a CD-ROM game yeah. for the PC. It actually allows uh, uh, a young budding filmmaker to come in and take about 200 shots and a couple of uh, ways, different ways to tell a story and make their own movie on the PC literally taking existing footage that w was shot with, with actors and a couple of storylines, one dramatic, one comedy, and you can mix and match. You can just do straight drama, straight comedy, make a rock video out of it, but you can create your own movie and then go back in and create your sound effects and create your music. And then at the end, wait 45 minutes and your film comes back all done. A little curtain opens on your computer screen. You get to watch your movie back. It is terrific. Mm -hmm. I call it film school in a box. <laughs> <laughs> It's different from when we were young. Yeah, yeah, I wish I had something like that when I was on. Up the hill from here, there's the Jurassic Park ride at Universal. To what extent were you involved in designing and creating that? Um, <clears throat> well, I approved, I, I approved the concept of it, and I had a couple of ideas for it, but pretty much it was the game designers at MCA that designed Jurassic Park. Um, you know, I, I was involved with them at a very early stage, and I certainly wanted the, it to start with herbivores, you know, grazing, where you think you're in, on a very peaceful journey, and then by the end of it, the raptors are attacking, and the T-Rex is trying to get you, and, and, and it's a bit like the movie. They, they follow the film in terms of the, so the whole bell curve of the film they followed pretty, 
accurately, but uh, they added a lot of things that, that are humorous that you wouldn't expect, and, and I think it's a good ride. I hear there's an absolutely terrifying drop that gets you wet. I've never been on it. You're joking. I, I won't go on drops. I won't go on anything that goes fast downhill. So they added that. And I said, okay, you guys can add any drop you want. I'm not going on the ride. So I've been on the ride up to the top, and I've gotten off and gone down the emergency exit, and I've not gone down the, 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 the chute yet. So Steven Spielberg will uh, never go on the Jurassic uh, Drive well, drop. I will never, yes, I will never complete the ride. <laughs> Hang on. They're pushing us over the cliff. Hang on to something! Hang on to something! It's interesting to see your name on films, or Amblin's name on projects, and one wonders, as one looks from, from afar, the extent to which you yourself are involved. Take the television series, ER. Do you have anything to do with that? No, <laughs> I don't. I mean, ER, I'm very proud of it, and my company produces it, mm. along with uh, Michael Crichton's company, Constant, and Warner Brothers. But uh, I had a lot to do with the casting, you know, I didn't pick the cast, but I approved the cast that John Wells had selected, and along with uh, the, the director of the, of the, of the pilot. Um, uh, 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 um, but I, 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 you know, for the first year, I pretty much read every treatment, gave my comments, and read every, every little teleplay, and wrote my comments down and sent them to John Wells. But it was, John was the showrunner. He was in charge of the show. But second and third year, I've had virtually nothing to do with the show. The, show, the show's a hit. Doesn't need me. Didn't need me the first year, because John Wells is so bloody good. Um, but it was fun dabbling that first year and just being able to see where the show is going and be able to have a little bit of input, but it's not really my show. I'm just proud that my company does it. But, for instance, on one of the first projects of your new company, DreamWorks, Peacemaker with George Clooney, it's directed by a relative newcomer, Mimi Leader. Uh, how much do you get involved in the production? Uh, only when I'm invited. Mimi invited me to see an early cut of her picture, which I looked at with her. I don't impose myself. On, 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 you know, unless, you know, the director either asks me to see something or there's a problem in a production and they have to, that requires our, our looking into it. But, you know, I really believe in giving filmmakers as much autonomy as, as, as I certainly, you know, have enjoyed. Uh, you have to earn your total autonomy. I'm not going to give first cut to a first time director, certainly, but, um, you know, I'm very respectful of how hard it is to make a movie and how personal that film becomes and how the script. Uh, 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 does change because it goes through a vessel called the director and that vessel does interpret it any way he or she desires and and so I have a great deal of admiration and respect for directors and for writers and I, I kind of like to stand on the sidelines and watch that process uh, you know evolve but I don't get really that involved except on the scripts I get very involved on the, on the scripts once the script is set everybody's happy with it I kind of go away and the director goes and makes the movie Shedless List was a success of a different kind, but had this vast audience, more than 75 million people. What are the consequences to you of making Schindler's List? Well, it changed my life in a pretty profound way. Uh, it, it pretty much, you know, turned me, it turned me out as opposed to turned me in. I had been pretty much turned in to myself. And I think in a sense that film created a responsibility that I'd never really felt I had. It gave me something to believe in. Uh, it, it started me to try to figure out how can I uh, preserve the memory of the Holocaust, not just in a movie that will, could be forgotten someday, but how can I preserve the memory of the Holocaust through eyewitness testimonies of the survivors who were actually there. So I began the survivors of the Shoah Visual History Foundation. And thus far, in, over the last two years, we've recorded 26,000 Holocaust survivor testimonies on uh, physical tape that is then databased uh, digitally, so it'll be preserved forever. And we're our our, our goal is uh, fifty thousand, and we'll reach our goal within two years. So it's it changed my life in the sense that it has turned me away from my own selfish considerations and into kind of, you know, you know, uh, 
and it's gotten me active with living history, which is, which is a very rewarding thing to be active in. I missed all the causal things in the 60s. I wasn't really, I wasn't a Vietnam activist or, 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 or I wasn't a, you know, a, 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 I wasn't, what, what do they call them, a, a student radical. I pretty much was just making movies and making little films and bigger films and I, the world was sort of going by. I wasn't watching the news and I think I've become a little more um, involved in the world because of Schindler's List. Spielberg used part of his earnings from Schindler's List to initiate the Survivors of the Shoah Visual History Foundation, a worldwide program to record the testimonies of Holocaust survivors. He explained it to Ben Kingsley, an actor from the film. So we move through this, uh, uh, this world of faces yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Mm. So what we have here is all the names of all the survivors. There will eventually be, in the first three years, 50,000 testimonies rescued from the 300,000 survivors that still exist today. But in 10 years' time, there will not be that many survivors. So it's a race against time to get as many survivors to testify on videotape as possible. So with every name, you'll see a picture and a small little summary of who they are uh, so I can type in a name, Henry Rossmern. People who would teach, uh, you know, he would kids, uh, when I was little, he did that, I was 19 and a half. And, I, and what I, this I essentially is, is Henry has just given two to five hours of testimony about what happened to him in the Holocaust. He plays the harmonica, mm -hmm. which is why he survived. Mm -hmm. this, this saved his life. When the survivors are speaking, almost like a online living documentary, uh, automatically maps and pictures of oh, themselves yeah. and actual photographs, documentary movies of the ghettos they were in, the forced labor camps they were in, will automatically be triggered by what they're saying and at, at appropriate moments will scroll on. So you're looking at almost a living document of, of, of you are watching a living document of, of, of one's experience in the Holocaust. Presumably the main value of the Shoah Foundation is to stop a terrible thing like this ever happening again. Yeah, it's, it's about teaching basically racial, about racial hatred yeah. and, and, and trying to understand why people hate and, 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 and what can we do to, to lead people not to hate each other for differences that cannot be controlled. And, and, and I think that's, the young people have such interesting responses to, to stories about hatred and <clears throat> the one that I'll never forget is the black community was shown Schindler's List at the, at the uh, Apollo Theater, Theater in Harlem on the night of the Academy Awards, actually. And uh, two young boys, 11, 12 years old, had come out of the, of the cinema. And one African-American boy said to this other boy, well, I don't understand it because, uh, you know, it didn't happen to my people. It happened to a people I don't know about, but it sure didn't happen to me, so why should I care? And the other African-American boy said it was friend, because pain is pain. And I always thought that was one of the most moving and profound things I've, I've, I've heard. Your next film is about slavery. I mean, is this going to be a Schindler's List for black people, as it were? Well, that's not my intention setting out. My intention is to tell a really significant piece of history that I think everybody needs to know about, African-Americans and and, and, and white Americans and Asian Americans and Latino Americans, I mean, everybody should know about what happened to the slaves. And, 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 and it's, it's not a sprawling epic the way, in a sense, Schindler's List took on the entire Holocaust mm -hmm. as seen to the eyes of several significant characters. Uh, the Amistad is a much smaller story about the court case where the 44 Africans were put on trial for their lives because they had taken over a slave ship a Spanish slave ship called the Amistad, which means um, friendship. And, um, and they, they had killed several of the crew members and the rest uh, jumped overboard. And the Africans told the two surviving Spaniards to turn back toward Africa and head east. And instead, they headed north and wound up uh, um, being, being captured off the coast of uh, Long Island and taken to prison where a trial began, several trials for their lives. It was over a two and a half year period and they were in jail for all that time, uh, where their defense attorney was the 74 year old ex-president John Quincy Adams. And the prosecuting attorney behind the scenes was the sitting president, Martin Van Buren. Uh, it's, this is often called the, the, the trial of the presidents. And it happened between 1839 and 1841. So it was an interesting period of American 
history and black cultural history, and it's it's a I just think it's a movie that was compelling. It sure caught my interest, and I I, I like to tell the story. Some of your contemporaries, good film directors, seem to me to make the same film again and again, but I perceive a growth in your work. Well, yeah, with a few detours to make a lost world once in a while. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to think that. I'd like to think that. You know, I began my personal journey when I be, when I directed Color Purple in 1984 or 83, whatever. I forgot when I actually made that movie, but <clears throat> you know, in the mid 80s, I made that picture, and that really allowed me to make Schindler's List. You know, a decade later, uh, without Color Purple, I wouldn't have made Schindler's List because I, I began to grow up through film as well as you know, uh, having a final time. You know, you know, sort of tickling my own imagination and sharing that with other people. I began to find that the personal movie was much more rewarding for me, uh, that I was able to put more of myself in a film with the color purple than I, I am able to put myself in Indiana Jones uh, uh, movies. Before he began preparation for The Lost World, Spielberg broke with his past by launching a new studio, DreamWorks. I, I think I realized one day that I had always been working for other people, mm -hmm. that with all of my independence and my <clears throat> and my uh, rights to make my own movies and cut them the way I'd like them to cut and spend as much money as I think they, they, they deserve to be spent on them. And I pretty much, every film was like a, being done by my own small studio. And yet they were controlled and owned by the, the copyright holders and the studio that put up the financing. And I always said to myself, you know, it's interesting, in my entire life, you know, um, we have an automobile, we have a house, I have a wonderful family, you know, you know they, they own the clothes on their back. And yet the job I go to, you know, I'm always working for somebody else and I don't own the real estate, I'm not part of the land that I, I've built my career on. And I just thought that it was about time that I started my own company where I could at least have the pride of ownership, not just the pride of leasing or renting, but the pride of really being able to to invest in the movies I make and then let those movies you know, help the company to grow and, and, and where everything invests in itself. Do you think if you were to look in within yourself that one of the reasons for building a studio is you want to leave a sort of a monument behind? I don't think about building like monuments and things <laughs> for things that last. I think film lasts longer than anything else. I, I, th I think film is the most lasting antiquity to leave behind and so I'm, I don't think building a building will last. Uh, because a, a, a tractor someday can just demolish it. They, you know, they set those charges, and you've seen those buildings <laughs> being blown up. They kind of just like come down from the top, and there's a big dust cloud, and so that's gone like that. And uh, no, I think film will always be the most lasting memory of anyone's life. So, what is DreamWorks' mission statement? Well, DreamWorks' mission statement was basically to uh, not run with the herd, mm -hmm. but. You know, you know, do pictures and TV shows and games and books that appeal to us personally and not have to follow trends or be compelled because of uh, the fiduciary obligation to a public company, which we are not, to have to make the kind of movies we don't want to make. Every major studio makes a number of films every year that they do not really want to make, but they have to fill the bill. They have to, you know, they have to compete with the Joneses next door and they have to make their 35 pictures a year. And we never wanted to be in that business. I certainly didn't want, want to have to make a movie I didn't want to make. If I make a bad movie that people hate, they'll, of course, say, well, you didn't have to make that bad movie that we hated. But it's probably because I wanted to make that movie, and maybe I like it, and it's not so bad in my eyes. And maybe it just failed along the road, and it never, we never intended it to be bad. But uh, you know, I like to make fewer movies so I could guarantee that I'm more satisfied as opposed to making so many movies I can't possibly watch all those eggs in one basket. It seems to me that at the age of 50 you're starting to pile up the work again. How do you um, allocate your time? It seems after those few years off, you've, you've got Private Ryan we hear in the works, where you, you may come back to Europe, will you? Yeah, for the whole film. So you're piling up work again, are you? Yeah, yeah. and Why I'm piling up children as well. <laughs> work and children, work. you know. How many children? I have seven kids. Yeah. Which is a lot, lot more challenging than making a seven million dollar, seventy million dollar movie. I, I can tell you, uh, <clears throat> the home life and 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 my family is my number one priority, and it always has been ever since I had family. It's it's been my number one priority. And how do I balance it? I don't know, but I haven't heard that many complaints from my kids until they start complaining. Where's daddy? Then I know things are going along okay. <laughs> Yikes. 
is this is magnificent. Oh yeah. Ooh. Ah. That's how it always starts. But then later there's running and screaming. What is it? Mommy's very angry. 